Hello, everybody. Good evening to everybody. Uh, I first, in the outset, I take apology from all of you that I could not log in properly on the last uh, Wednesday due to some technical hitches. <clears throat> in continuation of the previous lecture by Dr. Uh, Soika Sengupto on the Anastasia machine, we will be continuing these lectures subsequently. And uh, I will uh, advise all the students especially to go through these recordings of these lectures again and again because you have that facility. And if you do not have, uh, if you find any difficulty in understanding a particular uh, portion or anything, you should go back to your teacher in your respective medical colleges to make you feel, uh, make you understand the intricacies because uh, these lectures are a very vast subject and especially the first year students. Nowadays, the uh, due to the COVID situation, many people are not going inside the OT to get the exposures. So the Table side teaching is completely off nowadays, which is a very disadvantageous position for the first year students. So I will advise you to take this tip from me. And now we shall start today's lecture. First lecture is by Dr. Purba Haldar, and she is the associate professor of Department of Anesthesiology in Lampurhat Government Medical College and Hospital. And she will be talking on the breathing circuits in continuation with the anesthesia machine. You now have the breathing circuit. And later on, we will have Dr. Palash Kumar, who is the director of Kolkata Anesthesia Academy, scientific secretary, ISA West Bengal, and as a consultant in the Woodlands Hospitals, Kolkata. She, he will be talking on medical gas storage and supply scavenging system, etc. So without wasting much time, I think we should go over to Dr. Purva Halda to start our lecture. Thank you, sir. A very good evening, everybody, to everybody. In the um, in such a time of COVID uh, scenario, for long days we are uh, stuck in home and we are going to duties. But you have rightly said that uh, it is very difficult to meet our student in the OT and giving an hands-on demonstration to the various uh, gadgets of anesthesia. So only uh, good friends and good academics uh, from this uh, in this forum via this forum can keep us alive. Thank you, the Indian Society of Anesthesiology, Swiss Spring branch, uh, Dr. Shujata Di, Dr. Palash Kumar and uh, Dr. Sarbori Madam. I have tried to make my presentation more student friendly and uh, those uh, the questions uh, are commonly asked in the exams are uh, mostly I have tried to cover. So we will now start our presentation. Now starting with my polls. Uh, first question is rebidding may be influenced by number one that is phase gas flow number two option the arrangements of the components in the breathing system number three the mechanical dead, dead space and number four is the size of the reservoir bag viewers more persons are more left to give your poll total 111 participants and please give your poll for the first question so ma'am can we end now in five four three two one uh, the poll uh, the maximum answer is on fresh gas flow yes around yes. 51 percent so yes. do we end it now yes ma'am okay so we are ending the poll Okay. Now we'll go to the next question. Our next question is in which of the following breathing circuits the fresh gas inlet are most distant from the patient connection port? The choice are Malam Mapleson A, B, C, and D.
way that the co complete question is visible on the screen. Yes, yes, ma'am. They will be able to see the okay. question. No problem. So please answer. We will end the poll in uh, five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one, and zero. So the maximum answer is on the first option, that is Mapleson A. So we are ending this poll, ma'am. Okay. Going to the next one. Okay. Our next question is: Which of the Mapleson system has their coaxial configuration? Mapleson A and Mapleson E, Mapleson B and Mapleson D, Mapleson C and Mapleson F, or Mapleson A and Mapleson D, the coaxial version. So we will end now. Yes, yes, yes. Five, yes, four, three, two, one, and zero. We end the poll. The maximum number of votes has gone to the last option, that is Mapleson A and Mapleson D, followed by thirty-six percent who have answered Mapleson B and Mapleson D. So then we'll go to the next question. Yes. The fourth question is the most common location for the fresh gas inlet in the classic circle system is just upstream of the respiratory unidirectional valve between the pressure manometer and the absorber between the inspiratory unidirectional valve and the Y piece and the last option is between the spirometer and the expiratory unidirectional valve. Do we close the poll now, ma'am? Yes. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. So the most of the votes have gone to uh, the first option, just upstream of the inspiratory unidirectional valve, followed by the third option between the inspiratory unidirectional valve and the Y piece. Okay. So going to the yes. going to the last poll. Now our fifth question is injection is modification. What extra part is added to modify the Mapleson E system? The first option is an inspiratory limb, second option an expiratory limb, third option an adjustable pressure limitial valve, and final option an anesthetic reservoir bag. The fourth option. Mapleson E is used in pediatric patient. So we will close now, ma'am. Yes, we can close now. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. So uh, most of the uh, votes have gone to the last option, an anesthetic reservoir bag that is forty-seven percent, followed by an adjustable pressure limiting valve. Uh, this has got thirty-eight percent. We'll start with your presentation, ma'am. Yes. So we will start the presentation. Here it is, ma'am. Yes, good evening. Now today's presentation, the breathing systems in anesthesia. What is the breathing system and what is the breathing circuit? First, the definition. Now, breathing system describes both the apparatus and the mode of operation by which the inhalation agents are delivered to the patients. And breathing circuit is defined as the assembly of components which connect the patient airway to the anesthetic machine, creating an artificial atmosphere from and into which the patient breathes. 
Now, all anesthesia breathing systems at, uh, are having two fundamental purposes. These are the delivery of the oxygen or the anesthetic gases, and the other is the elim elimination of the carbon dioxide, either by washout with adequate fresh gas flow or by soda lime absorption. The criteria or the requirement for the ideal breathing system. What are those? There are some essential criteria that th those are they should deliver gases from the machine to the alveoli in the same concentration as set in the machine and in the shortest possible time. And they should e efficiently eliminate the carbon dioxide. They should have minimum apparatus dead space and have late, low resistance. There are few desirable characteristics that is economy of the fresh gas, conservation of the heat, adequate of the humidification of the inspired air, etc. Now, what are the components of the breathing system? The components are a fresh gas entry port, a reservoir bag, an expiratory port or expiratory valve, corrugated tubes or connection connecting these components. Next, uh, more components are a CO2 absorber if total rebreathing is to be allowed, the connectors and adapters, the bacterial filter, the heat and moist exchanger, flow directing valves may or may not be present. Now, Firstly, we'll deal with the reservoir bag. These are usually made up of rubber, synthetic latex, and neoprene. They are either round or ellipsoid in shape. They are functions. They act as a reservoir for the fresh gas flow, and they provide the peak inspiratory flow and provides a mean whereby ventilation may be assisted or controlled. Next is the breathing tubes. These are made up of either rubber, plastic, or silicon. They are arranged either side by side or in a coaxial fashion. They can be impregnated with silver to add antimicrobial effect. Now, what are the functions? They can act as a reservoir in certain system and they provide connection to one part of the system to the another system. Now, the APL valve is very important part of the breathing circuit. They are also called the expiratory valve, the pressure relief valve, the pop-up valve, the heat brink valve, the dump valve, exhaust valve, or spill valve. Examples, the spring-loaded disc, stem, and seat type of valve. Now, the spring-loaded disc, it is most commonly used type. It has got three ports, the inlet, the patient, and the exhaust port. The exhaust port may be open to the atmosphere or the scavenging system. Now, in spontaneous type of breathing, we should keep the valve fully open or partial. If we keep the valve uh, in a partial closed fashion, then it will give a CPAP effect. And in controlled ventilation, the valve is partially left open. Now, mechanism of the APL valve. During the sp spontaneous ventilation, the patient generates a positive pressure during expiration, causing the valve to open. When there is any increased pressure generated within the circuit uh, that is above the atmosphere, the uh, valve usually opens. And during positive pressure ventilation, a controlled leak is produced during inspiration by adjusting the valve dial, allowing control of the patient's airway pressure. Now, we will go to the classification of the breathing system. There are different classifications. Deep set are classified them as insufflation, open, semi-open, semi-closed, and closed, depending upon the presence of reservoir bag, the rebreathing, the carbon dioxide absorption, and directional flow. Collins also divided the breathing system into two uh, divisions, that is, an, where the ambient air is allowed to enter in the system, that is, open or semi-open, or the system allows gas from it to enter in the atmosphere that is semi-open or semi-closed. Now, next is classification. It is very easy. That is open, semi-open, semi-closed, and closed. In open system, there is no boundary or no dead space. The examples are oxygen tubing near the patient or the uh, ether uh, mask, which are kept open. The, in a semi-open, it has partial boundary between the airway and the atmosphere. Here, when the ether mask is placed just above the face, that is uh, in proper position, it is it becomes a semi open circuit, and uh, there is no rebreathing. In the semi closed surface, it is fully bounded, prevents entry of the atmospheric air, but vents excess fresh gas. These are Mapleson system are included all in semi open system. 
and finally the close no venting of excess gas occurs all are rebuilt and the examples are circle systems these are slides to uh, give a more detailed idea about the system open semi open in open system uh, the examples are nasal cannula and open ether mask held away from the patient mask held away from the patient mask and when we fix the uh, open ether mask held close proximity to the uh, face it becomes a semi open circuit all vapors and rebreathing system comes in the semi closed system and finally the closed system the circle system with apl valve completely closed with complete rebreathing and conway classified the breathing system functionally according to the method used for co2 elimination what are those classification breathing system with co2 absorber and breathing system without carbon dioxide absorber what are these breathing system with co2 absorber it has got two type the unidirectional flow that is circle system one is uh, circle system with absorber there is an inspiratory limb and expiratory limb both are separate and with bidirectional flow that is to in to and fro system the breathing system without co2 absorption it is of unidirectional type no rebreathing non rebreathing circle system unidirectional flow that is non rebreathing circle system and other are bidirectional flow what are the bidirectional flow they may be either afferent reservoir system or efferent reservoir system in afferent reservoir system the examples are mapleson a b c and lax system and in efferent reservoir system the examples are mapleson d e and f how can it be classified actually in a uh, wind afferent system afferent uh, system that is these in these um, breathing circuits the reservoir bed present in the afferent limb and in the efferent type it is in the expiratory limb the bag is present in the expiratory limb now in 1954 on advice of william mushin mapleson reported on the functional analysis of the breathing system and classified the mapleson circuits now what are the mapleson postulates mapleson postulates which were published in 1954 they are gases move in block that is they maintain their identity as fresh gas dead space gas and alveolar gas there is no mixing of gases the reservoir bags continues to fill up without offering any resistance till it is completely full the expiratory valve opens as a reservoir bag is full and pressure inside the system goes above the atmospheric pressure and other is valve remains open throughout the expiratory pause without offering any resistance to glass flow and closes at the start of the next inspiration now what is apertus desperate this is very important it is a volume of the breathing system from the patient tent to the point to which to and fro movement of the expired gas take place that is it is the space between the uh, patient end of the circuit up to which up to which the to and fro movement of the expired gas takes place now this is the example of various circuit in afferent reservoir system the adequate with adequate fresh gas flow the apparatus dead space extends up to the expiratory valve position near the patient position the and the patient like in mapleson a and if the phase gas flow enters the system near the patient's end as the efferent reservoir system the dead space extends up to the point of the phase gas entry like in the mapleson f system or the um, d d type of circuit next is in systems where the inspiratory and expiratory limbs are separate it extends up to the point of bifurcation point of bifurcation of the circuit dead space now we will go to the mapleson a system what is mapleson a system it is also called magill system it was designed by sir ivan magill in 1930 it consists of a three way tube connected to the fresh gas outlet and reservoir bag and corrugated rubber tube it is good for spontaneously breathing patient it it has a corrugated rubber tubing 
that is 110 to 130 centimeter in length reservoir bag is at the machine end apl valve is at the patient end and the tube volume is more than tidal volume now this is the functional analysis of the maples and a system in the spontaneous respiration first is in the spontaneous breathing before putting a uh, putting the mask on the patient face the system is filled with the fresh gas before connecting to the patient when the patient inspires the fresh gas from the machine and the reservoir bag flows to the patient and as a result the reservoir bag collapses just the fresh gas flow is entering to the um, to the fresh gas flow inlet it goes to the bag and uh, then after it it travels to the um, the corrugated rubber tube and it is uh, it reaches to the patient so initially the bag collapses next is the expired gas and the uh, during expiration the expired gas and the dead space gas pushes the fresh gas from the corrugated rubber tube into the reservoir the fresh gas flows into the reservoir bag from the machine as the patient is still exhaling and bag is full the pressure in the system rises until the apl valve open to vent the exhaled gas the first portion of the gas is a dead space gas followed by the alveolar gases pass through the corrugated tube and some is expelled through the apl valve in this picture you can see the alveolar gas it is coming and this is dead space gas the blue color now during the expiratory pause the fresh gas washes the expired gas out of the reservoir tube filling it with again fresh gas for the next inspiration when the fresh gas flow is equal to the minute ventilation the expired gas with the fresh gas is vented through the apl valve and the system is filled with only fresh gas but if the fresh gas flow is very less than the alveolar ventilation then rebreathing can occur in the next inspiration so to prevent rebreathing rebreathing of the alveolar gas can be prevented if the fresh gas flow is equal to patient minute ventilation this is according to the body uh, weight and calculated now we will go to the maples and air bagel system what occurs in the controlled ventilation in the controlled ventilation we have to close or partially close the valve to facilitate the ippb the expiratory valve has to be partly closed during inspiration the patient gets ventilated with the fresh gas flow and part of the fresh gas flow is vented through the valve after sufficient pressure has developed to open the valve at the end of inspiration the bag is again almost empty then during expiration the fresh gas from the machine flows into the reservoir bag and and all the expired gas that is dead space gas and alveolar gas flows back into the corrugated tube till the system is full there is a insufficient pressure in the system to open the apl valve during the next inspiration the alveolar gas is pushed back into the alveoli followed by dead space gas and then the fresh gas when the sufficient pressure is developed part of the expired gas and part of the fresh gas escape through the valve so in the control ventilation there is a control uh, as a considerable rebreathing as well as excessive waste of the fresh gas fresh gas hence these system are inefficient for control ventilation the fresh gas flow more than 20 liter per minute is required to prevent rebreathing during the control ventilation so it is non economic now lack system it is the modification of the maples and a system that is a coaxial modification fresh gas flow through the outside tube 30 mm exhale gas and through the exhale gas is through the inner tube this is the fresh gas flow it comes uh, comes uh, through the outer tube this is the outer tube and the exhale gas goes through the inner tube it is red exhale gas is pink or red or inhale gas is of cream color the reservoir bag is at the machine end 
now the lax modification what is lax modification lax circuit is essentially similar to the functions of the mangle circuit during the spontaneous and controlled ventilation except that expired gas is carried by the inner tube placed coaxially and vented through the valve placed near the machine it is also better for spontaneous ventilation this is lax system next is test for mapleson system tested for leaks by occluding the patient end and closing the valve and pressurizing the system the um, oxygen is fully on and we close the patient end and close the uh, valve opening the apl valve will confirm the proper functioning of the component if we open the apl valve it will expel some air in addition to the user or patient should breathe through the system to rule out any block next is in test for lag system same as the maple shape system with testing of the integrity of the inner tube here an endotracheal tube is attached to the inner tube and valve is closed air is blown in the air is blown then air is blown if the leak is present there is movement in the reservoir bag and another is occlude the both limbs with apl valve open squeeze the bag and any leak in the inner tube is confirmed by release of the gas from the apl valve and the bag will collapse the next is mapleson b here the fresh gas inlet is near the uh, patient here this is fresh gas inlet distal to the expiratory valve and just distal to the expiratory valve it is used mostly in spontaneous respiration the fast inspiration patient breathes only the fresh fresh gas here fresh gas is coming from here and expiratory valve opens when the valve circuit in uh, the pressure inside the circuit increases and the mixture of alveolar gas and fresh gas is discharged now it is mapleson b in expiratory pause as the fresh gas uh, there is an in expiratory pause when the fresh gas inlet is near the apl valve and the fresh gas except through it during the expiratory pause some some fresh gas also expels through the valve as it it is placed near the apl valve during next inspiration the apl valve closes uh, a mixture of retained fresh gas and dead space and alveolar gas is in it apl and during the next inspiration when the pressure Uh, comes down the apl valve again closes and the mixture of retained fresh gas and dead space and alveolar gas is inhibited rebreathing is avoided with fresh gas flow rate of greater than 2 is the minute ventilation for both spontaneous and controlled ventilation next is mapleson c it is also known as water circuit what is it it is almost similar to the mapleson b but the main tubing is shorter this tubing this tubing is shorter a fresh gas flow equal to the twice on the minute volume is required to prevent the rebreathing and carbon dioxide builds up slowly in the circuit so it is very common to cause co2 retention and rebreathing now what is the difference between the uh, mapleson b and mapleson c to reduce the rebreathing of the alveolar gas a fresh gas entry has shifted near the patient this is the fresh gas entry shifted to the patient this allows complete mixing of the fresh gas and the expired gas here the end result of this system are neither efficient during spontaneous or not during control ventilation this b and c neither efficient during spontaneous nor during control ventilation now the mapleson d very important here the fresh gas inlet here near the patient end and the corrugated rubber tubing at the on end of which is connected with the expiratory valve and the reservoir bag mainly used with assisted or controlled ventilation a fresh gas flow of 70 ml per kg per minute is usually adequate for the controlled ventilation in it increases with the expiratory time as the expiratory time increases there is increase in efficacy of mapleson d system now this is mapleson d system and this vein uh, mod modification by veins modification of mapleson d by vein and sporel was done in 1972 it is a coaxial system where fresh gas flow through a narrow inner tube within the outer corrugated tubing outer corrugated white tubing and a green tube which uh, takes oxygen from the machine and it is 
or it opens towards the patient end the length is variable so that we can use in different setting and uh, that there is dead space is outer tube up to the expiratory valve approximately 500 ml that is a tidal volume now flow rate is actually the the fresh gas flow is coming fresh gas flow is coming here this is the fresh gas flow inlet it is going towards the patient and through the outer tube through the outer tube through this valve the expiratory gas is going out now next is the functional analysis of the vein circuit in the spontaneous aspiration the breathing system should be filled with fresh gas before connecting the patient when the patient takes an inspiration the fresh gas from the machine reservoir bag and the corrugated tube flows through the patient during expiration there is a continuous fresh gas flow in the system at the patient end the expired gas gets continuously mixed with the fresh gas as it flows back into the corrugated rubber tubing and the reservoir bag so next is once the system is full of excess gas it is vented through the atmosphere through the valve situated at the end of the corrugated tube near the reservoir bank during the expiratory pause the fresh gas continues to flow and fill the proximal portion of the corrugated tube pushing the exhale gas in front of the in front of it and it is vented through the valve it is vented through the valve now during spontaneous ventilation when the next inspiration occurs the patient breathes only fresh gas as well as some part of the mixed gas from the corrugated tube all portion of the mixed gas is not expelled out through the valve now the mapleson um, uh, mapleson d circuit that is a vein circuit with controlled respiration to facilitate the IPPB, the expiratory valve to be has to be partly closed so that it opens only after sufficient pressure has been developed. When the system is filled with fresh gas, the patient gets ventilated with fresh gas flow from the machine and the and the corrugated tube and the reservoir bag. This is dotted uh, part of the fresh gas, so the patient is receiving the fresh gas flow. Now. In the bin circuit during expiration, the expired gas continuously get mixed with the fresh gas that is following into the flowing into the system at the patient end. During the expiratory pause, the fresh gas continues to enter into the system and pushes the mixed gas towards the reservoir. Here, the mixed gas is pushed towards the reservoir. Now, when the next inspiration is initiated, the patient gets ventilated with the gas in the corrugated tube. That is a mixture of fresh gas, alveolar gas, and the dead space gas. As the pressure in the system increases, the expiratory valve opens. Here, the expiratory valve get opens, and the contents of the reservoir bag are discharged, and some part of the expired gas comes to the atmosphere. Now. It has been the calculated and clinically proved that phase gas flow should be at least 1.5 to 2 times of the patient minute ventilation in order to minimize the rebreathing. And the factors which are responsible are phase gas flow, the respiratory rate, and expiratory pause, and the tidal volume. These four, uh, four uh, parameters uh, regulate the inspired concentration of oxygen or fresh gas in this system. Now, there are few advantage and few disadvantage. I'm not mentioning this. Now, the petit test. Petit test is a unique hazard. It is an unique hazard to use a vein circuit in, uh, as there is occult dis disconnection and kinking in the inner tube. So the if it occurs, the entire corrugated tube becomes a dead space. So how we can test the uh, test the circuit? Occlude the patient end of the circuit as it uh, at the elbow elbow of the circuit. Close the APL valve. Fill the circuit using an oxygen flash uh, valve. Release the occlusion at the elbow and the flush at a time. We can uh, release the occlusion at the elbow and flush. And if venturi effect will occur, it will fatten the reservoir bag if the inner tube is patent. If the leak is in the inner tube, the fresh gas will escape through the expiratory limb and the bag will inflate. 
the bag will inflate then the face gas flow recommendation by bain and sporel it is 2 liter per minute face gas flow in patients less than 10 kg 3.5 liter face gas flow in patient between 30 to 50 kg and respiratory rate should be would be 12 to 16 breath per minute now coming to the maple cell e system or rstps it is introduced by philips ir in 1937 it is available in metallic and plastic form the length is approximately 5 cm and diameter is 1 cm it has minimum day space no valves and very little resistance this is a maple cell e system and this is the tps what are the components of the tps t shaped tubing with three ports the fresh gas flow entered through the side arm. This is a side arm and fresh gas flow enters through here. The second part goes to the patient. This is the part which is going to the patient. And the third part is connecting to the reservoir bag. Third part is connecting towards the reservoir bag. Now, during spontaneous ventilation in inspiration, the expiratory limb open during inspiration. And uh, since uh, peak inspiratory flow is more than fresh gas flow, some gases drawn from the reservoir limb. If the reservoir limb capacity is less than tidal volume of the patient, the air dilution occurs. And in during expiration, both the exhaled and the fresh gas flow pass to the reservoir limb and then to the atmosphere. Then to the atmosphere. During expiration, this is the expired air and some part of the fresh gas flow, this is coming here are going to the reservoir tube to the atmosphere. Now the expiratory pulse. It classes the exhaled gas out, uh, excess gas out refills reservoir limb whose diameter must be sufficient to produce low resistance for the appropriate flow rate. And during control ventilation, it is done by intermittently occluding the end of the reservoir bag. As there is no bag placed here in Mapleson E system, we have to occlude this part of the reservoir limb with thumb. That may lead to over inflation of lung. So chance of barotrauma is much more. So there is there came a modification that is Mapleson E or RSTPs. The fact um, in the Mapleson E system. What are the modification? As it go, uh, as the Mapleson E system has uh, some disadvantages, but many other disadvantages. So there is a modification. What are the modification? The Mapleson F system that is done by Jackson Rees modification of RSTPs. The most commonly used TP system in the Jackson Rees modification of RSTPs that is Mapleson F system. It is connected with a 500 ml of the two-ended bag to the expiratory limb. A bag is included. It was a question. A bag is included in the Mapleson F system and the gas escape via the tail of the bag. This tail is open. We can occlude it during assisted ventilation. Now, it functions like maple cell D system. The relief mechanism is whole at the end of the end or the side of the bag. The newer modification incorporates some APL valve in the reservoir bag. The fresh gas flow here is 2 to 3 into minute volume for spontaneous respiration. And for um, to prevent rebreathing in controlled ventilation, we should give 1000 plus 100 ml per kg during controlled ventilation. Now, Mapleson F system, that is Jackson Revolver. What is the mechanism of action? For spontaneous respiration, relief mechanism of the bag is fully open. Small movement of the bag indicates the pattern and rate of breathing. For controlled respiration, during inspiration, whole of the bag can be occluded partially or completely by the user during the inspiration and ventilation is done by squeezing the bag. During expiration, the open end of the bag is released to follow, to allow the gas so that it can escape. Now, these are the advantages and disadvantages of the Jackson Reef modification. So to prevent rebreathing, we have to give the fresh gas flow in the Mapleson A system. It is 1.5 to 2 times of the minute volume. It is uh, 2 to 5 in the control, 2 to 5 times at the minute volume. So it is not efficient in control ventilation. In D, Maple cell type D, in spontaneous, much more uh, phase gas flow is required. And in the small control, it is 70 ml per kg per minute. And um, 
for the uh, Mapleson ape system, it is uh, 2 to 3 into minute ventilation and it is 100 ml per 100 kg per minute. Now it is combined system, Humphrey ADE system. In Humphrey ADE system, uh, it has got two reservoirs, one in the afferent and one in the efferent. And system can be changed to uh, change to ARS to ARS by changing the liver, changing the liver. This is a liver and using adult and children. Now we will come to the circle system, that is breathing system with CO2 absorption. It is very important to understand the circuit. The circle system with CO2 absorption, com absorption the components are the fresh gas antipode, the two unidirectional valve, the soda line canister, the Y-piece to connect to the patient, the reservoir bag, the relief valve, and the low resistance interconnecting tubing. What is this? This is a circle system. We will construct it in next few slides. The ideal criteria for the circle system, the fresh gas flow should enter into the system proximal to the inspiratory unidirectional valve. It should be entry. This is the entry of fresh gas flow. And this is the uh, inspiratory unidirectional valve. This was a question. There should be two unidirectional valve in either side of the reservoir bed. And the relief valve should be posted in the expiratory limb. This is the expiratory limb. Here is a relief valve. To reduce the pressure inside the expiratory, uh, the pressure increased pressure generated in the expiratory limb. Now, let us start adding parts to our circle in a step by step way. A circle is added to the patient. This is a circle, the breathing circuits. It is added. I know uh, parts are now um, incorporated here. We will add step by step. As it is a uh, fixed tubing, though we have connected the patient with a circle, he will unfortunately not be able to breathe in or out from him. Why? It cannot stretch. Circular tube is made up of non-stretchable material, so it cannot stretch and pa the patient cannot yes. breathe in or breathe out. So we have to add a stretchable object. What is that? To allow the patient to breathe in and out, we attach a flexible bag or a reservoir bag. Next is, we have a reservoir bag, but we have to add some air, that is the life-saving air. If we leave the patient like this, then he will not survive. Why? There is no oxygen. Then oxygen come out to the, from the flow meter of the anesthetic machine, and we have to add it. Now, we have added the flow meter. We keep our patient alive, so we supply fresh gas flow, that is oxygen is coming now in next part this is the inspiration we can see oxygen is coming from flow meter this is the inspiration and this is the expiration after inspiration expiration patient is expelling and it is coming into the reservoir bag next step we add two one-way valve in the circle y system and force the patient to inspire from one part of the circle we have added one one way valve here and one one way valve here so that when the patient takes inspiration this uh, valve opens on this direction so that the oxygen can flow and enters in the patient respiratory system and during expiration when the patient breathes out the air will go into this way to the expiratory limb and this valve will open in this direction so that the um, expiratory um, the expiratory gas passes only through the expired air it will this valve will not open in such a fashion that expiratory gas will come can come in this direction so during inspiration the expiratory one way valve closes preventing the patient from inspiring inspiring the gases he just breathed out and the inspiratory, inspiratory valve one way valve opens letting the patient inspire gases rich in oxygen and during expiration the reverse will occur that that is this valve closes this valve opens that is expiratory valve one way valve will open and this part of the tube which is from the inspiratory uh, one way valve to the patient is called the inspiratory limb and this is the expiratory limb that is from patient to the expiratory valve it is called the expiratory limb now Another is another problem is that reservoir uh, get, uh, reservoir bag is getting mysteriously bigger and bigger as there is no 
one way valve here so it can burst it can burst now if we don't uh, do anything it this will create this problem and now we have to add a pressure limiting outflow valve that in the circle valve has a disc that is designed to open when the positive pressure develop letting the excess glass to flow when there is high pressure this uh, piston will come upward and there is a space letting the gas which will go to the atmosphere now some pressure relief valve now during inspiration the pressure in the system is very low so pressure limiting outflow valve remains closed during inspiration during inspiration this uh, pressure inside the expiratory leaf is very low so this uh, valve is kept closed and during early expiration the expired gas go to the reservoir back it goes to the reservoir back as the pressure is low the pressure limiting outflow valve is also closed this time in early part of the expiration it is also closed now expiratory gases fill the reservoir back and the pressure in the circle system rises when the pressure in the circle system rises when the pressure in the circle system rises it causes lifting of the outflow valve to open and releasing the excess gas in from the circle system this is the arrow and now are you happy with the circuit the patient is uh, but patient is still inspiring his own co2 why rebreathing is occurring and the co2 is coming again to the patient inspiratory limb and it is going towards the patient respiratory tract what have we have to done we include a co2 absorber this is a co2 absorber in the circle system as the patient inspires the co2 containing gas from the reservoir bag passes through the co2 absorber this is a co2 absorber and absorber absorbs co2 making the inspired gas co2 free here co2 is completely absorbed so the gray color dots are na not here here there is no gray color dots and thus to keep the patient asleep we add an anesthetic vaporizer that is yellow dots to the fresh gas inflow using a vaporizer we add a vaporizer again now circle system may be closed may be semi closed or semi open how it may be closed the fresh gas flow exactly equal to the patient uptake uptake and complete rebreathing of the co2 absorption and the pop up valve is closed here the pop up valve is closed when it will be semi closed some rebreathing occurs some rebreathing occurs and fresh gas flow and pop up valve is at intermediate values and when semi open no breathing no rebreathing and high fresh gas flow so we have to give the fresh gas flow very high in the circle system in a open system now what are the composition of the absorbent it may be a soda lime it one may be a lime and um, soda lime composition of soda lime is calcium hydroxide water the sodium hydroxide and potassium hydroxide in beryl lime is again the um, barium hydroxide the calcium hydroxide uh, it does not require silica but it is 15% less efficient than the soda lime the beryl lime now the reactions that are, that commonly occurs these are the steps for the reaction that is carbon dioxide plus uh, mixes with water co2 it will produce co2 co2 plus h2o that it, it will convert it into sodium bicarb when it uh, reacts with the NaOH it will convert it to sodium bicarb and finally this sodium bicarb along with calcium hydroxide will make it calcium carbonate the sodium hydroxide and water next is what are the advantage of the circle system it is mostly used in the low flow uh, as it, uh, we can use low fresh gas flow in the system so it is very economical adult and child appropriate sizes are there uh, there is a uh, chemical neutralization of carbon dioxide can be done and as uh, the uh, the rebreathing is uh, there is complete uh, rebreathing the moisture and body heat are kept uh, conser uh, conservation of body heat and moisture can be done and it uh, scavenging system is very efficiently used in the circle system next is what are the disadvantages uh, there is bulky size or greater size uh, less portability it is difficult to carry there is complex uh, very complex attachments and difficulty in predicting inspired gas so these are some disadvantages now 
the waters to and fro absorption system patient breathes to and fro from a reservoir bag which is connected to the face mask and ett via the canister soda here it is canister soda here it is a reservoir bag and this is a patient end it is a maple cell c system you can see no limb no the um, there is the long tube is absent here and fresh gas introduced at the patient end this is the fresh gas going to the patient end and exhaled co2 is absorbed by the soda lime this soda lime will absorb the exhaled co2 it has uh, got some few advantage and disadvantage that is advantage are inexpensive portable etc and the take home message will give uh, take home message from the um, mapleson system that is uh, circuit a b c d e f that is for spontaneous ventilation uh, based uh, circuit is maples and a for control ventilation in adult it is maples and d and for children below 20 kg uh, both for both spontaneous ventilation and control ventilation it will be maples and a system and uh, this is the uh, approximate uh, um, fresh gas flow required for the uh, different types of circuit so we come to an end of my presentation now we will go the for the result of the polls thank you hello ma'am you want the result of the polls right yes 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 now our first question that your breathing may be influenced by the answer is face gas flow i cannot see your faces i think our students are happy this is the second question the answer is maples and a the face gas inlet is most distant from the patient connection port now the third question which of the mapleson system have their coaxial uh, configuration that is answer is mapleson a that is lac system and mapleson d that is vein circuit this is the answer for third question mapleson a and mapleson d next is the most common location for the fresh gas inlet in the classic circle system is just upstream of the inspiratory Unidirectional valve, just upstream of the inspiratory unidirectional valve, and the answer for the last question, the most common location for fresh gas inlet in the class area already discussed, and five is injection is modification. What extra part is added to modify the Appleson E system? It is an anesthetic reservoir bag. Now this is the answer. thank you chujata ji i cannot hear you thank you dr purba thank, thank you, you very much and uh, uh, should we take the questions right now yes uh, can we take up some questions if there are any are there any questions Uh, you see in this this chat box, you can type in your questions. If you have I, any questions, I think we can just have the questionnaire uh, at the end of the uh, Dr. Kumar's lecture together. Yes, that you can do as well. Let them think about the questions and write it. Yes, okay, we uh, can when do you, it. Uh, and when you. when you type in a question just uh, this button called chat mode on the right side it you can change it to an q and a mode and your questions will be marked as a question so so dr polish do we go on to the next part of our session yeah we can do that we can do that and uh, yeah uh, please start thank you so much and please start so uh let us continue on our gaseous journey today uh we have began in the middle uh during the portion where the gases were being administered to the patient 
Now this second lecture deals with those gases, but before they reach the machine, how do they reach the machine? And secondly, when do they leave the machine, what happens to them? So before and after, it's like a parenthesis to the first lecture. We're going to go through some definitions which are boring but necessary. And the rest would not be exactly in the same uh, order, but we are going to go through the production, transport, storage, and supply. Uh, we'll cover these things. And we'll talk a little bit about cylinders. Cylinders are one of the probable things which can be asked, though in most places we are moving away from cylinders. Most of the time we are using pipe gas. So we'll put a little more emphasis on the pipe gas supply than we put on the cylinders. And we'll look at the septic mechanisms discussing all these things. Uh, so pressure. Pressure is the first thing that we need to define. This is not exactly a definition of pressure, but these are a few of the units that we're going to be using. These are very confusing, and uh, they will continue to be confusing, but we will have to uh, sort of uh, once one atmosphere pressure. And roughly 100 kilopascal is about one bar or one atmosphere. Uh, what we know for sure is that millimeter of mercury, we are not going to use store at any point of time. Millimeter of mercury, 760 millimeter of mercury is equal to one atmosphere that we know and often use, but we're not going to use it. Centimeters of water, we are not going to use it. What we're going to use is uh, pound per square inch. So one atmosphere or one bar is going to be 14.7 uh, pounds per square inch. We can approximate it as a um, uh, as a as 15. So and what we are also going to use is a, a pascal. So a pascal is a, um, kg per centimeter square. And we are going to use kilopascal. So which will be a thousand pascals, kg per centimeter square kg per meter square, sorry. So when we go to kg per meter square, uh, kg per meter square is Pascal. So we can use kg per centimeter square. So one meter is equal to 100 into 100. So one million. So kilopascals, is, wow. 1,000 kilopascals would make one Pascal. Quite boring, you know. Uh, gauge pressure is something that we're going to use uh, often. Whenever we're talking about the pressure, like say, if I say my blood pressure is 120 by 80, uh, what this pressure thing means is that when you say 120, it means the actual pressure is 120 plus the ambient pressure. So gauge pressure, that means when we were, we are measuring pressure on a pressure gauge, the zero is referenced against the ambient air pressure. So gauge pressure is the pressure above the atmospheric pressure. Also, the absolute pressure minus the atmospheric pressure. Whenever we mention about pressure, in the next throughout this lecture, it will mean a gauge pressure. Uh, this is a very critical diagram. So uh, on the on the horizontal axis, we have increasing temperature. On the vertical axis, we have increasing pressure. And we have got three states of matter. Here we have got solid phase. Here we have got vapor. Here we have got liquid. And here we have got something in between vapor and liquid, which is a supercritical fluid. So, so if a matter or if a substance has a temperature which is above the critical point, that means in this area, then whatever pressure that we use, how much pressure we increase, we are not going to make it a liquid. To super, we can reach a supercritical fluid, but usually a supercritical fluid is reached from the fluid state by increasing the temperature. So something that is above its critical point will remain as a gas. It cannot be compressed into a liquid. And the same gaseous thing below its critical point is called a vapor. So a vapor is a form of a gas which can be compressed into a liquid if we increase the pressure. And the pressure is a critical pressure. Now, triple point is a point which is well, as we can understand, matter can exist in all three phases, which is not of our interest. So what we are interested in is a critical point. So a gaseous substance below its critical point is a vapor. And a vapor can be 
at the at the whatever temperature it is if we increase the pressure it will become a liquid so that's all we need to remember from here we are talking about medical gases there are multiple medical gases that we are uh, we are we are concerned with we we oxygen medical air nitrous oxide nitrogen instrumental air or surgical air carbon dioxide medical vacuum and the last is waste anesthetic gas disposal or anesthetic gas scavenging system so all these things uh, nitrogen compressed nitrogen is used to drive instruments pneumatic instruments the same for instrumental air and surgical air so these two things uh, are used to drive pneumatic driven instruments tourniquets etc medical air and the difference between medical air and surgical air is that medical air is can be breathed used used for breathing surgical air is not to be used for breathing but their quality controls are roughly similar also one important aspect is the pressure at which they are supplied medical air will be supplied at approximately 4 bar that is approximately 55 to 60 pounds per square inch and uh, instrumental air will be supplied at about approximately 70 bars that means that it's going to be close to uh, 100 uh, pounds per square inch so let us cover these things one by one so medical air it can be prepared or it can be synthetic now synthetic air something is you know something air something is just so around cannot survive without air and we're talking about synthetic air since you're talking about purity there would be places where air would be so polluted that the usual filtration systems present at site cannot produce an air um, which is pure so <coughs> synthetic air production is very simple we have both cylinders of nitrogen and oxide uh, oxygen we mix it 21% oxygen rest nitrogen what we have is synthetic air it is filtered it is dried it is oil free and their guidelines are the national fire protection agency 99 standards for healthcare facilities so this is the guideline that they go, go through the major uses are in anesthesia as a carrier gas for volatile anesthetic agents as a power source from pneumatic equipment but if you are supplying at a four bar then it's not adequate pressure it can be used in ventilators as a driving gas or in incubators to produce an uncontaminated and controlled air flows. It can be also used in cleaning and drying equipments. The pipeline pressure is 50 to 55 PSI. Now, what are the maximal allowable impurities are 0.5 milligram of particulate oil. Just remember the things. There's no need to remember the exact value. So very low particulate oil mist very low carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide and obviously there should be no bacterial contamination medical vacuum uh, we are used to seeing vacuum uh, machines inside our operating theater suction machines the most significant drawback of a suction machine which if you're not aware you must have become aware during this covid times is that the exhaust gas comes inside the operating room so whatever is being you know suction from the patient's body there is no filter and it opens into the operating room so the chances of pollution the biomedical hazard is high and also they are quite noisy they're unreliable so having a medical medical vacuum running all around you know it's a one-time investment and you have a, a, a suctioning apparatus at any point of the time because suctioning is not only necessary at the operating room we need it at almost every bedside the recovery rooms the every bed inside the PACU the ICU and most of the HDU and even in the wars even emergency so a medical vacuum pipeline running all throughout the hospital is an essential ingredient and which you will find in almost all big private set of hospitals in Kolkata so they're supplied by vacuum pump systems, which are exhausting to the atmosphere. And the liquids and solids do not move any further than the collection container. So there are systems in place which prevents the aspirated suction material from getting into the main pipeline. The vacuum pressure keeps fluctuating throughout the pipeline. That's one of the problems. That's why bigger pipelines are used in the initial cases, and then there are smaller pipelines. However, the vacuum is tried to be maintained at around minus 560 to minus 450 millimeter of mercury. This is how the uh, a very uh, schematic diagram looks like. We have a source of vacuum. This is a source of uh, vacuum line. You have a regulator which regulates the pressure. These on-off valves are very important. They will present everywhere. We'll be discussing about these things also. There's a filter here which prevents things going into the vacuum source. 
Now we have one the reservoir bag here. This this is the drain collection, and this is where the surgeon's uh, suction catheter is. It comes in the deflector here. You see that so that do not splatter into this uh, uh, you know outing pipe. They collect here, and there is this disc or something depending upon what kind of suction apparatus we have. This closes once this thing is full, so that will sort of prevent an overfill protection and things getting into the main vacuum source. Nitrous oxide, a very commonly used anesthetic, though its use is falling, but it is still commonly used, especially if you do not have medical air supply, you will have to dilute the oxygen most of the time, and the only option that you have is nitrous oxide. It's also potent analgesics. We're not going into the debate about using nitrous oxide. Since it's an essential component still now, uh, we will go through this supply of nitrous oxide thing. First produced by Joseph Priestley in 1772, investigated further by Humphrey Devy. It is manufactured by heating ammonium nitrate to 250 degrees centigrade. It produces a lot of uh, impurities and the temperature has to be precious, uh, uh, precisely maintained. And they're delivered in the hospital in high pressure French proof cylinders and supplied through the medical gas system. Boiling point is minus 88 degrees. Critical temperature is 36.5. That means at an ambient temperature, which most of the time in our place is less than 36 degrees centigrade, it is possible to compress nitrous oxide into a liquid, the critical pressure being 72 bar. That means 72 times atmospheric pressure. And how it is supplied to the hospital? They are supplied to the hospital either using individual cylinders or a pipeline supply from the cylinder bank. Oxygen, the most important gases of all. It is omnipresent and is manufactured by fractional distillation of air. The detailed process is available. If you are interested, you can read about it. But if you go through a two-stage distillation process, it yields about 99.5% oxygen and a little bit of argon. Uh, I was under the impression that medical oxygen is the purest for form of oxygen that we get, but uh, uh, I was doing a bit of reading lately and figured that there are purer forms of oxygen available and they are mostly supplied for very pure scientific experiments and chemical reactions. So medical oxygen has an oxygen concentration of 99.5% or above. A large amount of oxygen is stored and transported in the liquid form. So when we make a gas a liquid, we can, you know, in a small form factor, we can hold a large amount of gas. So Transporting and holding and storing things in a liquid form is advantageous for us. Okay. Uh, and the last point is new. Uh, so supply is the pipeline supply from liquid oxygen or a cylinder bank. Usually there is a liquid oxygen supply in most of the places because uh, oxygen is used a uh, a lot so it's very difficult to supply from a cylinder bank it's not economical so, so to simple scale of economics dictates that we have liquid oxygen supply in the hospital premises and as a backup we have to have cylinder banks we can also have individual cylinders which are mostly used during say patient transport or using uh, transporting a patient between wards or to an am ambulance and often there would be uh, fail safe systems with a couple of big cylinders if both these liquid oxygen and the cylinder banks fail because we, we have to have multiple fail safes for supply of oxygen. Oxygen concentrators are another thing. We are not also, also not going to uh, decide about, discuss about these things, but they, they use zeolite to filter uh, nitrogen and carbon dioxide and water vapor and, and can get a really high concentration of oxygen, say 90%, 95%. This is how a a schematic diagram of how the uh, gas and the vacuum supply, the pipeline supply on whole hospital. So let us have a look at these individual components. At the very bottom, we have our supply system. So in many of these cases, they have to be you know, properly insulated. There have to be proper ventilation some of these times. The fire safety has to be adequate. And uh, sometimes they're situated out of this hospital. This liquid oxygen container and uh, the liquid oxygen supply system. This is with the uh, heat exchanger installed outside at the uh, oxygen container, liquid oxygen container. It is outside the building always. And what we have here is we have got a double oxygen bank to as a function as a fail safe mechanism, or if necessary between oxygen filling up of this liquid oxygen tank, we have got a big nitrous oxygen supply cylinder, two banks with big cylinders. 
Then we have the vacuum system, multiple motors, and these tanks to store the vacuum. Storing the vacuum uh, allows us to ensure keeping a constant, more or less constant pressure because the uh, demand of suction is very variable. So when suctions, multiple suctions open up, the vacuum levels can drop. This is the pressure system. Uh, there are the pumps and there are the filters and they also store the filtered air in pressurized containers. And we have the AGSS or WAGD, whatever we call it, anesthesia gas scavenging system or waste anesthesia gas disposal. So we also have a vacuum pump here and the storage of vacuum. And I can see that's a differently color coded. They've got pipelines and they have all have controllers in place. We will cover these things later on. This is how the whole pipeline system looks like. Uh, here we have our supply system. And we can see these brown color copper pipes running through these things. Now there are different kinds of pipes. One of the major pipes, which are, uh, if I may zoom in a little bit, uh, these are thicker pipes. As you can see, they are also color coded. And, and they move up. And then at different floors, there are horizontal pipelines, the branches which are running out. And here also the branches we are running out and supplying other systems. So when these branches are coming out, they are narrower tubes. These tubes also have color coding. There are sub branching as well. And at each branching that there is, there are valves which will uh, switch off the flow to certain areas and there are control panels. And in the supply areas, you can supply that through wall outlets or through pendants or whatever is necessary. And the same system exists in the wards and other places as well. The patient's bed had the requisite number of things there. You can see only three things there. So that's basically oxygen and vacuum and compressed air by the color coding of this. So I hope you have some idea how this whole uh, hospital is this pipeline supply, how it is structured. Now, liquid oxygen, they are kept in vacuum flasks, which are called vacuum insulated evaporator. The giant thermos flask, there is an inner steel covering and there's an outer steel covering. And there in between these two steel coverings, there is a vacuum. You know, the vacuum prevents the movement of heat, convection and conduction <coughs> of heat is prevented by a vacuum. They're located outside the hospital buildings. And oxygen is drawn up. Yeah, just, I need it. Well, they are located outside the hospital buildings. And oxygen is drawn off as needed, passed through a vaporizer, and turned into a gas before it is piped to the individual wards. Now, one very important thing is that this system has to be designed in such a way so that it can accommodate huge fluctuations in oxygen demand. Suppose in this COVID era, you know, you have to start high flow oxygen nasal oxygen in three or four patients, suddenly your oxygen demand is going to shoot to the roof. You are going to increase your oxygen consumption by, say, 200 liters per minute, and uh, which were the baseline, maybe 50 or 100 liters per minute. So the system has to incorporate all these wide fluctuations in place and maintain a constant pressure supply. And there's a control panel that regulates the flow of the gas from the VIE, the vacuum insulated evaporator, before it enters the hospital pipeline. This is the structure, and this will also tell us how these things are maintained. So what we have here, we have this uh, vacuum insulated tank here. This blue portion is the liquid oxygen. Here we have this gaseous oxygen. The pressure is 1,000 kilopascals, and this is maintained at minus 105 degrees centigrade. Now, there is no active cooling system here. In spite of not having an active cooling system, such a low temperature is being maintained. We will see how it is maintained. You can see that there are two pressure gauges there. This one is connected to the top of the this, this, uh, this cylinder, this flask. So this measures the pressure of the oxygen that is inside. And what this measures is the two pressures. It is connected here and at the top and the bottom. And this gives us the difference of the pressures of the top and the bottom. The pressure at the top is only the pressure of the oxygen contained. And the pressure at the bottom is this pressure plus the hydrostatic 
static press the two due to this there in the tank and will be connected to the central uh, you know monitoring system so this would tell us how much oxygen is there and when we need to refill it and we can fill this by opening up this filling valve now this is the pipe which connect this thing to the hospital pipeline system we, we have a blow off valve here set at 1500 kilopascal that means if due to some reason the pressure inside increases then at 1500 kilopascals this will open and vent the extra oxygen into the air now why that would be necessary it can be necessary in two uh, major reasons one that if demand for oxygen falls sharply due to some reason and there is excess oxygen builds up and the pressure builds up and the second point is that there is heat gradually seeping in into this chamber maybe a very hot environment and so there is more oxygen which is evaporated and more, more pressure builds up <clears throat> now when there is blow off from this thing then some oxygen is still more evaporated liquid oxygen gets evaporated and comes out through this thing and this oxygen that is getting evaporated gets its latent heat of vaporization from this body of this liquid which cools down this liquid so gets this temperature down and school liquid also prevents further vaporization thereby reducing this pressure and keeping it within 1500 kilopascals now if the other thing happens suppose we have a very high oxygen demand a lot of oxygen is coming out and the temperature of this thing is falling because of loss of latent heat of vaporization so the pressure it can so happen that the pressure or or it may be we are in a very cold environment the ambient temperature may be five degrees or zero degrees or maybe minus 10 degrees so so not much heat is able to come in so the pressure inside this now if this pressure falls significantly say less than 1000 kilopascals this will open and there is a this is basically a heat exchanger which will allow some heat to seep in into this tank to this connection so this will raise the temperature of the oxygen liquid oxygen more oxygen will vaporize and will raise the pressure to the required level and when this pressure rises to 1000 kilopascals and above this valve will shut so by these two mechanisms there is a constant pressure of oxygen maintained into this this constant pressure of oxygen allows us to maintain a constant flow of oxygen now after the oxygen comes out there is a heat exchanger which you saw in the first picture that i have shown you in the schematics that heat exchanger increases the uh, uh, increases the temperature of the oxygen brings it closer to the ambient temperature before it is supplied we have a pressure regulator here we have two pressure regulators here pressure regulators are always multiple in number because we want to have a more precise control over the pressure that we are of the gas that we are putting into the pipeline if we have a single pressure regulator with a very large jump then precise precise control is difficult so there's a first regulator which brings down it to 1000 kilopascals and then the next it brings us to 440 kilopascals so 440 kilopascals is going to be somewhere around 55 to 60 pounds per square inch now here we also have a cylinder backup in case there is a pressure fall in pressure if this thing fails to keep up the supply suppose if these things have mechanisms are failing or if we have a too low oxygen supply liquid oxygen then the cylinder backup will kick in so this is how the liquid oxygen supply maintains a steady supply of oxygen into the hospital pipeline system next set of supply is by a cylinder bank now the rest of the gases also oxygen and nitrous oxide are supplied through cylinder banks that means the bunches of very big cylinders are bunched together and they supply because if you're using small cylinders you'll have to change those cylinders very quick and if <clears throat> there can be pressure fluctuations there can be times when we lose gas supply so we'll have cylinder banks with a large amount of gas being drawn so what are the requirements of a cylinder bank? We have to have an uninterrupted gas supply, a smooth switchover between the banks. It must be automatic and is usually electrically controlled. Uh, the, the thing can be mechanical, but there is some sort of electrical control which makes this thing possible. We should have a stable pressure output from the system. We have to have alarms for both high and low pressure. 
we have to have an alternate supply source. If this thing fails, we have to have an alternate supply source. And there should be no disruption of gas supply even in the event of an electricity failure. So this switchover should be in such a way that once a switchover takes place, that switchover is maintained even when there is a disruption in the oxygen supply. Or there has to be a manual override which is which we'll be able to utilize in, in, in a scenario where there is a power failure or we have to have backup power. It, the best solution would be to have all of these things. Now, this is a schematic of the pipeline supply system. There are two banks of big cylinders. We are not showing a supply with the reserve power supply. So what we have here is that they're connected and there are individual shut off valves which can, you know, disconnect this whole cylinder bank from the rest of the system and the hospital pipeline. So if we have to change these cylinders, we'll have to shut this off and change these cylinders. Then we have pressure indicators on both sides. We have a pressure regulator on both sides. Then we have an automatic control with a changeover alarm, with a sensor and an alarm. Because why do we need an alarm is that the people who are monitoring these things must know that one bank is coming close to an end and it will end and it has ended so that the cylinders have changed. And then we have a isolation valves on both these things. We have the final pressure regulators and the pressure indicators and check valves on both the sides and then it gets into the main pipeline. Of course, there are separate shut off lines as well. So what we have here is the pressure control, the ability to uh, separate each bank from the rest of the supply chain and a pressure regulating system. And then we will have a pressure relief valve and something that needs to be walked on it. They can also be separated by the separate isolation valves. Now let's have a look at another diagram of the same thing. So what we have here is the two banks that are in use and the reserve banks in use. This will help you understand how the switchover takes place. So we have a control lever and there is these two valves which are set at 700 kilopascals and this is set at 500 kilopascals. So since the pressure is high here, so this will not open till the pressure in here falls below 550 kilopascals. So right now this thing is open and we are supplying gas to our system with a second stage uh, regulator and an alternating input and isolation system and blah, 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 blah. We have a blow of valve here in case the pressure rises too much, which is supposed set at 930 kilopascals. And we have an alarm here, which is set to 650 kilopascals. And this is an amber alarm tells us that the gas pressure is falling. So what we are going to have what we're going to have, suppose when these cylinders are in full use, the pressure is going to be 700 kilopascal that is reaching here above this. So this blow up valve doesn't work. This alarm does not go on and its pressure is reduced and nitrous oxide supply is going on. So once the pressure starts to fall, once the pressure falls below 700, 700 sorry, uh, once it falls below 650, then we will have an amber alarm, but still it will bring oxygen supply and once it gets to 550 then this is going to shut off and this is going to open this is going to open this valve and then this setup would be set at 700 and this would be set up at 550. So this switchover is take place and from this alarm we would know that the pressure has fallen. We would also have an indicator from here that would tell us that the changeover has taken place and it's time to replace the other cylinders in the extinguished bank. Now let us look at the distribution system. I have shown you these pictures with those uh, brass uh, pipe, copper pipes, sorry, not brass, copper pipes. There are three types of piping. The main lines, the pipe that's connect the source to the risers or the branch line, vertical pipes connecting the main line and that goes up towards the roof and their branch gives out branch lines on the various levels of that facility and branch lines are the lateral lines that take this to a room or a group of rooms at the same level of the facility. That means on a floor, it supplies a single floor. Now pipes, how should the pipes be? They're made of special high quality phosphorus containing deoxidized non-arsenical copper alloy, a lot of technical mambo jumbo. Uh, what it does is that it prevents the degradation of the gases and this also has bacteriostatic properties. 
Now, pipes with a diameter of 42 millimeter are used for leaving the manifold and 15 millimeter concealed pipelines end as gas into either flush walls or over a boom. We'll get to that later. And these terminal gas outlets are color coded specific for each gas. They also are labeled with the gas name, have self C. Healing, so it will not keep leaking. Before the system is started, the pipes are degreased, sealed, steam cleaned, and tested to 1400 kilopascal. The usual pressure range that we, these pipes will supply will be approximately 450 kilopascals. Now, status panels, which tells us about the pressure in the system. We need to have one status panel along with an alarm panel. Usually the status panel contains an alarm panel. That means if uh, it tells us the status and also gives out alarm if certain conditions are fulfilled. We need it for the operating room area or the packing room. That means places where the supply of gas should be, is very critical. And other medical, one into the gas supply office, which can be called an area alarm and the master alarm. So there are alarms in this area like an opening room or a PACU or an ICU and there are master alarms. Master alarms should be preferably be two. They're slave alarms. They, they should feed off a single sensor but one of them should be in the um, you know the gas monitoring area. The other should be an area which is constantly monitored like the main nursing office or the, uh, or the uh, telephone office etc. Uh, and there should be a procedure in place what happens in case of an amber or a red alarm you know shoots off so people should know what to do if we have a red or an amber alarm this is what it looks like uh, this is a powers uh, uh, you know the power is on so we have our oxygen nitrous medical air air that means this is at air at seven bar this is at four bar is a blank when I've got medical vacuum. We've got connecting pipes that are color coded and with isolating valves. They can be moved to not to block the line, but isolate this machine. It needs to be turned to isolate this machine. So what we have here is that there are three lights, high, normal, and low. You can see that the oxygen, nitrous, and med air have pressures of 58, 63, 57. So the green light is on. The air seven, that means which should be at seven bars. Seven bars means seven into 15 will be uh, much higher than this 57, which is approximately four bar. So the pressure here is low as the amber light is on. And this vacuum is minus, of the minus is not there, so it is minus 613. So this is also perfect. So this is also normal. So, and this is an audio visual alarm. There is a test button which is allowed, which is used to test the system and this test, there should be a regular maintenance schedule which presses this test button and tests if this is working properly. So this is a uh, area alarm system or monitoring system with an alarm panel. Now there are valves, there are plenty of valves all throughout the hospital pipeline system. There are basically of two types. One is a pressure relief valve, so it vents the gas if the pressure rises too much into the system and there are shut off valves which can be a manual or a service valve uh, manual is something I mean, the service valves are also manual valves but service valves are not accessible to the ordinary um, uh, you know folks who are moving around the doctors technicians the hospital they are uh, allowed to access those service valves there they can be only accessed by biomedical guys and people who are maintaining and servicing the pipeline and these shut valves will isolate a section or a zone. I'm going to see how this thing, this is a complete. And this is a riser column giving us branches going into patient's room. And this is into anesthesia locations. And this is you. So we have mainline shut off valves outside, inside. We have got emergency outside connection. And we have got a vent going to the outside, which is connected to a relief valve. So the pressure rises, we've got one relief valve venting outside. In all other places, these are the outlets. We have got zone valves, which will separate all of these branch lines. So 
Now, these are service files which are hidden, accessible only by the service people, and there are monitors. We also have these alarms and sensors, which we have here after the main alarm. We also have these zone alarms in important areas like PACO and the operating room. And all of these areas in the operating locations can be separated by this zone valve. So if there is any problem in any one of these isolated areas, the zone valves can be utilized to separate that area and carry out maintenance. Because unless we have this ability, we'll have to shut the whole system down, which is not possible. It can be dangerous. So there are so many valves which separates out all possible zones. Now, after going through all these things, we'll reach the end utilization. Places we're going to connect to the Anastasia machine and use the circuits that you learned about. So there are four basic types. They are, they are, they are very similar, but there are four basic physical, so let's say there are four basic phenotypes of connections. One is these wall outlets. You can see that they have got specific color coded and also has their name. These are wall outlets. These are hanging pipelines from the roof and this will connect directly to the anesthesia machine. This is a pendant. This is a pendant mounted to the wall. And uh, sorry, this is a pendant mounted to the wall. Sometimes it can be retracted. They will have multiple things like uh, power plugs and the gas sockets. And this is one of those arms which now most operating theaters, modern motor theaters has. They can articulate it. The difference is that this thing can move around and give you more flexibility. Sometimes the anesthesia machine can also be mounted on these arms if they can carry the weight enough. So the floor is free of pipelines. And they also have other things like uh, uh, data cable connection and power sockets. So connector. Connectors are very important. Those who have attended the last lecture by Dr. Shen Gupta would have learned a lot about this connector. So we're not going into too much of detail. So the most important thing that we have to know about the connectors that they are non-interchangeable, of course. Gas specific connection point or socket with some form of integral labeling. So they would have the name of that gas printed on them. And as many as uh, things possible. They would be specific for the gas. They would have be color coded. The connector may be a screw threaded connector, uh, NIST, which is popular in, at least was popular in UK. The disc, the diameter index safety system, and the quick connectors. The quick connectors are the most popular one. And they are equipped with a backflow check valve. That means once you, uh, the gas will not move back to this pipeline system if there is, you know, some other source is connected to that machine. Also, once you open them, the self-sealing, they are not going to leak the gas. This is a diagram of a shredder quick fitting connector. Here is the connector that here is the pipe will connect to this thing. This is the assembly, maybe connected to the wall or maybe a hanging pendant or some sort of things. You can see there are two sorts of two sorts of valves here. So it goes in, it pushes this back, so it opens this seat. This also pushes this back, so this also opens this valve here as well. So there are two check valves here. So once this comes out, they both are going to come out and leak, so no gas is going to come out. And here, the, the way to insert it is just to push it in. It just connects. And once there is this colored blue circle or the whatever white blue colored circle around you, you press that, this pops out. This is the quick connector on the machine side. There are two. There is. One is nitrous and one is oxygen. The nitrous one is blue. If you can uh, appreciate here that this, okay, uh, first this one, you, you can see that the inner diameter is almost identical, but this one is circular and this one is hexagonal. And there are color coded pipes. Now, once you move closer to it, they also have the name inscribed. And you can see this is an hexagonal thing, this is a circular thing. So you cannot push in one to the other and you can also appreciate the diameter here and the diameter here is different. The shape of this locking thing, this shape of this locking thing is also different. So uh, these things are specific, color coded with labeling. You can just push it in and pull it out easily. Pipeline testing, large number of testing. This is mostly I've given it for a documentation purpose. I do not personally do not know most of these things. Uh, some of these tests are done initially when uh, the pipeline is set up. 
the basic thing is to check for leaks and the actual the correct gas is leaking there because we have talked a lot about this pipeline system but still so far if you have noted carefully that we have not mentioned there is any safety parameter that ensures that the oxygen pipeline is actually delivering oxygen there is no such safeguard we have got connectors in place but if there is some problem in the um, in the in the initial supply side or if there is some cross connection between the pipe some during repair or during faulty construction there will be no way to know that we are actually getting the wrong gas so even we have all this specific colored coded and uh, connector specific to specific gas we have to have an oxygen monitoring device at the point of care when the air is entering the patient's lung we must monitor fio2 Now the problems with the pipeline system, inadequate pressure of course, lakes of course, excessive pressure can be remedied by using uh, venting valves, alarm problems, the problem is not, uh, you know, when the alarm goes off, that's, that, that is a kind of a problem, we have a problem with pressure, and the alarms when do not function properly, there also is a problem, because we wouldn't know when there's a problem. Well, uh, cross connection of gases, contamination of gases, this is also difficult to pick up, there can be fires, depletion, and Heft. So these are the possible problems with the pipelines. Now let us move to cylinders. We are gradually uh, moving away with two hospitals with uh, pipeline supply. So we are using less and less uh, uh, cylinders. Even some of the modern anesthesia workstations that are, you know, many hospitals are buying now, do not exactly have an Indian yoke assembly we initially trained how to fit in a cylinder to an boils machine but we'll have to know something about cylinders because cylinders are common we need it for transport still now now the non-liquefied compressed gas so that a gas which does not liquefy at ordinary temperature and pressures less than 25,000 uh, psi that's a pretty high pressure like oxygen, nitrous, air, and helium, and liquefied compressed gas, which becomes liquid in ordinary temperature and, well, pretty high pressure, like nitrous oxide and carbon dioxide. So liquefied compressed gas will have most of the gas in the liquid form and a little bit of gas on top of that liquid. But compressed gas will have only gas in very high pressure within the cylinders. Components. Uh, this is not very important, but the body is mostly constructed of steel, steel with various alloys added. Uh, carbon steel was initially used, but presently good quality steel cylinders will use uh, uh, molybdenum steel, but it's expensive. Most of the cylinders in India are manganese steel. Steel carbon fiber, I have not seen one, but they're lighter and the walls are supposed to be a little thinner, so for the same size they will hold more gas. Aluminum cylinders, their classic utili utility is, well of course they're light and can be carried and smaller cylinders are mostly made with aluminum because people can carry it most before to be used out of hospital settings but in the hospital the most important use of an MRI since it's a non ferromagnetic material is in the MRI suit I think you know of this already so neck is the wicket pass where the cylinder becomes narrow it ends in a tapered screw thread into which the valve is fitted and the year when the cylinder was last examined the date of the next test is indicated by a plastic disc which hangs on the which is not hangs it's actually fitted on the neck valve valve is a very important component it is attached to the cylinders by a tapered thread it's made of brass with chromium plating for the small cylinders we've got small cylinder valve sizes a to e cylinders for large cylinders f to h will have the large cylinder valves and the two types of valves packed and diaphragmatic valves We'll show you pictures after a little while and explain them as well. Stem is something that protrudes at the top, which you, you have seen a cylinder, you have, you, have, you have opened a cylinder, you will know that you have, you have to rotate that thing to open it. So it rotates and the valve opens and you rotate the valve closes, of course, in opposite directions. When the valve is opened, the stem moves upward, allowing gas to flow to the port. Port is the opening through which the gas comes out. So uh, this is a packed valve. Uh, should I come here? Okay, 
So pack valve and diaphragm valve is basically the mechanism which uh, causes in the pack valve there is a packing material usually made of Teflon through which pressure is exerted and it closes the valve. Same here, but here in case of a uh, in case of a, uh, a large format valve, there is a driver square kind of thing here, and this presses down and this causes the seal here. And in case of diaphragmatic valve, there is a diaphragm here. The rotating of the stem pushes the diaphragm down. Here also rotating of the stem pushes the diaphragm down, which seals off the gas outflow. Now let's look at the other parts. This is a screw thread, same on both the types of valves, which connects it to the neck. You can see that is tapered. It makes the seal good. Usually there's a little bit of Teflon tape that is used here. No grease or oil is to be used to seal these things. This is a port through which the gas comes out. If this moves up, the gas will move out. And to this port, port the gas will move out. Here the port, in case of a big format valve, uses a screw threaded assembly. Now there is a safety relief device on uh, both these types of valves, whether this is a packed valve or a uh, diaphragm related valve. In both these cases, we have a safety assembly. This can be of different types, but the basic purpose is the same that it allows the gas to escape in case in case there is a sudden pressure buildup. Now another thing is present in both the sides in case of the um, small small valves is that you have a conical depression here. Now why this conical depression is there it case present in case of diaphragm valve also small depression here above the safety relief valve. Now what this does is that this allows the screw which Either there is a New York assembly or an or or an or an freestanding free pipe with, with a capsaicin port at the end, so that screw can be tightened, and the tip of the screw will get into this conical thing and create a pressure so that the uh, ceiling is there and gas goes into the supply channel without leaking. Now this is a small format cylinder valve. This is the port that is the opening. Okay, this is the stem. This is called a packing nut. This can be tightened to tighten this whole thing. And this thing down, uh, when you are rotating this uh, stem, you must not rotate this packing nut. Because if you rotate this packing nut, then you will actually cause the gas to leak. And uh, OK, there is one more difference, I think, that I should mention about diaphragm and packing packing valves. With a packing valve, to open the valve fully, you will have to rotate a number of times. So two to three times rotations, or two and a half rotations, which we usually do. So know that you have a packed valve. And if you have a diaphragm valve, it opens, gives a significant opening even with half turn or a three fourth of a turn. Okay, let's come back to the anatomy of the small cylinder valve. So this portion is the nut that goes inside the cylinder. This is the port through which the gas comes out. And we are going to talk about these two holes. This is the pin index system. Most of you, you know this thing. This is the thing that will be, you will be asked the most questions about. And this is the other side. This is the diametrically opposite to this side at, three, uh, at 180 degrees on the other side. You know? uh, so this is the dent in which the screw would go in. And this is the safety release mechanism through which a high pressure can be released safely. Now, this is called a Bodoc seal. This goes in here and creates a seal between this and the yoke assembly. So how it is structured, it's made of a softer material and has got a metallic uh, rim around it. Now the, it's made of a specific material called neoprene rubber. Other things like nylon or natural rubber will not work and will not be able to produce such an effective seal. Neoprene rubber is a type of modified natural rubber. So uh, this produces an excellent seal and this uh, Bodox seal has to be used when we are putting on a cylinder on the yoke assembly. Color codes. US follows a slightly different color code than the ISO color code, which is mostly universal throughout. The mirror is white. We're coming out with oxygen cylinders, which are fully white. But previous oxygen cylinders that we had has only as an as the white. So most of the time we're recycling those old oxygen cylinders. So we'll only find that the other cylinder first carbon dioxide is the instrument air is, uh, uh, is, 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 is black and white. 
nitrogen is black so it's a mixture air is a mixture of nitrogen and oxygen so medical air is entonos would be a mixture of nitrogen and oxygen so the neck would have a, a you know four like if you cut a pizza into four pieces so it will have alternative quadrangles of blue and white and vacuum is yellow and the evacuation is purple now sometimes these are also used on uh, the pipeline system as well filling limit so how far you can push a cylinder how much gas you can put in it we'd like to put maximum as possible if we're talking about a liquefied gas the pressure will remain constant till there is liquid so pressure is going to be constant till there's some liquid so that means we will use most of the gas most of the gas in the present in the cylinder but still the pressure is going to liquid so when the pressure turns to fall it will fall really fast so how much of it can we fill it's uh, the thing is called a filling ratio or a filling density this means that the ratio of the weight of the gas in the cylinder to the weight of the water that the cylinder can hold suppose we have got a cylinder which can hold 10 liters of water that means a 10 kg of water so in case of nitrogen and carbon dioxide the filling ratio is 68 percent so that means since the cylinder can hold 10 kg of water we can have 68 percent of that in the weight of that gas so we can have 6.8 kg of nitrous or carbon dioxide put into that cylinder the volume which this gas wise is different so we're not talking about the volume that this gas will occupy inside the cylinder only the weight of the gas inside the cylinder to the weight of the water that this cylinder can hold now if we are in a very high temperature zone then this filling pressure should be reduced something to 60 61 percent if we're talking about a non-liquefied gas then it is only limited by the pressure if you put more pressure we'll be able to put more gas but the surface pressure that the maximum pressure that this can uh, hold is at a 70 degree fahrenheit and 130 degree fahrenheit 1.5 times the surface pressure cylinder sizes and contents I, I i have sort of have a confession to make that this thing i find is extremely uh, confusing i was trying to find an universal solution to this because everywhere there are different values um, the the major suppliers of uh, medical gas in india is now done solely by a single company previously it used to be uh, british oxygen boc and uh, there is one US company, uh, but both these things have been taken over by uh, Lind. So all, all Linde is supplying all of the medical gases now, but the Linde India website has a positive of information. I looked up the BOC website in UK. They have got an excellent information on the all the uh, cylinder sizes they supply, but they're nothing like the cylinder sizes they talk about because the cylinders that are left with are the old BOC cylinders so these are the particulars of these old BOC cylinders uh, the most common ones are the uh, DE and uh, J cylinders these are used in uh, uh, manifolds because they hold a large amount of oxygen the nitrous is not here but nitrous would be something around uh, uh, 14,000 15,000 liters and type E that is most commonly fit into these uh, uh, oxygen uh, you know uh, from the anesthesia machine and also used as a portable source oxygen can be filled up to 680 liters the pressure that it will reach is will be almost 1900 psi however with nitrous oxygen we will fill it about 1800 liters because it's in a liquid form and more liquid forms are more compact form but the pressure that we reach with this amount of nitrous is going to be 750 psi approximately with all these cylinders the pressure that will reach with nitrous is identical it is approximately 750 psi but with this oxygen when you're putting it it is going to vary the smaller the cylinder the thinner the cylinder the, the uh, lesser is going to be the filling pressure so with the smaller cylinders the pressures can be with d and e cylinders the filling pressure should be something around 1900 psi and with the biggest of cylinders the filling pressure would be higher something around 2200 psi Okay, pin index. It's an integral safety mechanism of uh, cylinders. Very important uh, in your viva. It consists of holes on the cylinder valve positioned in an arc below the outer port. 
so the cylinder has holes and the yoke or the pressure regulator has pins which are positioned to fit those holes so pins are four millimeter in diameter and six millimeters long except the pin number seven which is slightly thicker the seven hole positions are on a circumference of circle of nine is to 16 inch radius centered on the port okay so here are the seven ones uh, nine sixteenth of an inch from here on a circle you see the overlap but the overlap is does not cause any problem because we are going to choose two ports or one port if we choose two ports they are going to be separate now here are the common cylinders with the port sizes you will have to memorize this now one important thing if you are a very keen observer you will see that in carbon dioxide it is one and six one is on the left and six well you cannot see anything from here which one is one but air also has one and five so this one must be one which is on the left side but here it says one which is on the right side so it's a little confusing so this is on the cylinder valves which are the holes and this is on the yoke assembly which are the pins so they're going to be corresponding so on this thing this is going to point this side and this is going to be point this side oxygen 25 nitrous 3 and 5 Antonox is one with a single uh, pin which is seven testing of cylinders pretty boring you have to do a large number of things so the only thing that we probably do is you inspect visually for cracks dents leaks or distortions this tensile test, flattening test, bending test, and impact test done on 100 cylinders. They, know they are taken out, they're stripped, a small test strip of that metal is taken to test mostly for metal fatigue and if the cylinder is fit to be used uh, for a, another five or 10 years. There's also hydraulic test that it tests the cylinder to its 1.66 times its service pressure. It helps to determine leaks and structural strength and it has to be done every five years for steel cylinders and every 10 years for composite cylinders. This is to ensure that the cylinder will be able to withhold that kind of pressure and handling. The safe usages. Now the safe usages is a very big chapter. There are lots of points to be talked about. So we cannot talk about all those stuff here. Uh, only a few salient features to be handled only by trained stuff, not to be manhandled in any way. Kept away oils, rubber, and other combustible substances. Never exposed to a high temperature. <coughs> Valve is the part which is most prone to damage. Keep it closed when not in use. Small cylinders best stored upright. <coughs> Large cylinders, if they cannot be stored upright, can be laid on a flat surface, but people can trip over it. Don't drape any material during storage. This is a problem that I've seen at many places. Sorry. <coughs> Good segregation between empty and full. You no, know, you do not want to be caught empty handed when you want a full cylinder and cracking before use. Cracking is a favorite of many examiners. So what is cracking? Uh, the cylinder, the port of the cylinder is an opening. You know, in spite of covering up with an insulation tape, small dust particles can get into it. And if you connect it directly and switch it on, the small dust particles will enter the breathing circuit. And there will be delicate parts inside, especially the flow meter tubes and all, will be deposited on them and will cause problems later. <clears throat> so you gently open the cylinder. The port points away from any person. Let a little bit of gas flow you tighten the valve again then connect so this is cracking simple thing scavenging so you have successfully supplied gas to the breathing circuit and you have used the breathing circuit successfully to anesthetize now what happens to that gas that is coming out we're talking about scavenging also known as waste anesthetic gas disposal wgd or agss anesthetic gas scavenging system big and complicated names will stick with scavenging why do we need scavenging the main target is to reduce ot pollution uh, it's a big topic uh, the damages that are caused potential damages that are caused are not very well established but all the professional bodies which talks about workplace safety has 
levels of volatile anesthetics and, and nitrous oxide safely used in the OT and the numbers are very low. And unless you're getting your hospital accredited, you can you know, say bye-bye if you do not have scavenging system. So it is the collection and removal of the tinted anesthetic gases from the operating room. There are other methods as well to reduce pollution using total intravenous anesthesia, regional anesthesia, using low flow, which should be used anyways, and OT high air exchange rate. Now, uh, this is my personal opinion that all these things should be used even in the absence or even in the presence of a scavenging system. Now, an efficient scavenging system is capable of reducing ambient concentration of waste gases by up to 50%. Now, why, sorry, up to 90%. Now, there are always leaks, which, which reduces the efficacy of the scavenging system. So when you are mass ventilating a patient, you know, the whole of the gas is not coming back and getting exited through the exit of that machine. And there are leaks when you were disconnecting the pipes at any point to a breathing circuit. If there is any leak around your airway device, like a tube or an LMA, whatever you're using, so all these things will contribute to some amount of leak and you cannot have an scavenging system which is 100% efficient. Now, these waste gases should not be discharged in the outside air in an area where re-entry into the building is likely. Scavenging is also a very big topic. We're going to cover only the salient points. Now, the types, now, now the charcoal canister is something which I've added. The usual classical teaching is that these either passive or active, but charcoal canister is a possible type of uh, scavenging system. It is a canister which contains activated charcoal and is connected to the outlet of the breathing system. And it adsorbs, not absorbs, it adsorbs the halogenated anesthetics by filtration. It is replaced every 12 hours of use. So what are the drawbacks of using a charcoal canister? The advantage is the setup cost is the minimal. Uh, of course, a passive uh, scavenging system can also be often be set up with a with a very little uh, investment, and it is mobile. So if you are moving the machine, it will move with that machine. Very not not very often that we have to move a machine, but there are times when you have to move a machine. So uh, it's mobile can can have some benefits on the, on those cases. Disadvantage, of course, there is continuing cost of replacement because you have to replace it every 12 minutes or at least discard and fill it with new charcoal, which is cumbersome and uh, messy and still is costly. It does not remove nitrous oxide, which is very, very important. And when this thing is heated, this canister recalls the release of this inhalational agent. So uh, somehow the temperature rises, then this inhalational agents will be released into the circulation. So this is not a perfect solution. It's a stopgap temporary solution may be employed in some places. Now, these are the components of a scavenging system. So what you have here is actually a description of an active scavenging system, but it shares some of these components with a passive scavenging system. Now, the first part is the gas collecting assembly where it collects the gas from the after the anesthesia. So there are two basic sources. One is from the breathing circuit, APL valve, it goes here, and the APL bypass valve, that means something that comes out from the ventilator. And the ventilator can have an exhaust which bypasses the APL valve, of course, and also the ventilator driving gases have to be taken into consideration. Sometimes the ventilator driving gases will also be released through this thing. And so from these two outputs, the ventilator and the APL valve will collect it and it will get into this transfer tubing, which connects it to the scavenging interface. We'll talk about this thing. So this is scavenging interface, which is instead connected with the disposal tubing to the disposal assembly. That means it goes out. So this is a uh, this is a active scavenging system. Anyway, let us look at these components individually. The collection system, it gathers gram from the APL, also the exhaust port and ventilator. But what if we're using a Mapleson circuit. Now, this is talks about a closed circuit. If you're using a Mapleson circuit, then we have to have a special shrouded APL valve, and this shroud will be connected to this through a pipe to the, uh, the tubing, which will take it to the interface. So we need to slightly modify or have modified uh, Mapleson circuits. This collecting system must not cause resistance to expiration. This point is very important. Uh, we're going to talk about this thing again going forward. So 
this expiration, this scavenging system, one of the major risks of a scavenging system is adding to the expiratory resistance of the patient. So this is must avoid. That means that this pipe and big. Transfer tubing should be a different gauze to the breathing circuit to avoid accidental misconnection. Obviously, it should be distinct from all other anesthesia pipelines. Less than a meter long to avoid kinking. If there is kinking, there is potential <clears throat> pressure buildup. Patient gets a large unintended peep. The receiving system. Now, it must protect the patient from excessive positive or negative pressure. So. If there is an active scavenging system, something that is pulling gas out, it's possible to have a negative pressure in the system. So it must have options for preventing a buildup of excessive positive or negative pressure. It provides a reservoir capacity to cope with the peak expiratory flows. Now, this vacuum is going to work in a, in a constant rate. You can reduce and increase the vacuum, but it's not pulsatile. It's got a fixed, fixed rate. Now, the exhaust gas that is coming out is pulsatile. The movement of the ventilator, whether we're hand ventilating or patient breathing on his or her own, or the ventilatory exhaust gases plus the ventilator driving gases, this gas is going to come out suddenly. So there is a reservoir to cope with this expiratory flows. It's a similar reason why we have a bag in a, in a, in a, in a, in a breathing circuit. It's the same reason we have to have a reservoir. It should limit the pressure immediately downstream from the gas collecting system to a very narrow range of minus 0.5 to plus 3.5 centimeter of water under normal working conditions. A positive pressure relief is mandatory. And if the disposal system is an active one, we also have to have a negative pressure relief also becomes necessary. Now, let us have a look at this scavenging interface. This is an open interface. That means this reservoir is this you, you please zoom in a little bit uh, so this is the reservoir and here is the source connection from two sides it's coming in through this tube it is being released at the bottom this is the vacuum tube which is getting this gas up and this reservoir will hold whatever pulse or bolus of expiratory gas will come in and here you can see that there are Here you can see that there are clear openings in these areas. And these areas, uh, okay. these areas, these areas, it is open to the atmosphere. So this will prevent buildup of either a positive or a negative pressure. Here it is connected to the hospital vacuum, and this can be controlled by a valve. And we have a flow meter and float here. There can be a flow meter and float here also. This will tell you. This will tell you how much the vacuum is working. So gas comes through it and goes through it to the connection vacuum hospital suction. If there is excess gas or if there is more vacuum created here, gas will enter or exit from this open area, these relief ports. So when we have adjusted properly, the vacuum rate should exceed the rate of waste gas flow into the chamber. And some room air should also be drawn into the canister through the relief port. Now, our target is not to, I mean, to have a system which is functioning, which is drawing all the exhaust gases out. If our vacuum is too less, then there will be buildup of exhaust gases here, and it will spill out into the operating room. So our whole purpose is defeated. So we should have slightly more uh, vacuum than we actually need. So we will always have a little negative pressure inside so that it thing always entrains some air, ambient air into this canister through the relief port. This is a closed interface. That means, the, you see, this is like just a balloon. It's a big balloon. And, uh, um, and there is no opening here which easily opens to the, op to the atmosphere. So this is a closed system. Now, a closed system, if it's an uh, active system that is connected to a central vacuum with a control, we will have to have both positive and negative pressure relief valves. So what we have here is that uh, negative pressure relief valves at minus point centimeter H2, the two valves in fact, and there is a positive pressure release valve at plus five centimeter H2. Because if the vacuum is less than that, then this will gradually this reservoir bag will become inflated and the pressure would exceed and 
cause increased resistance to the patient expiration. In that case, this valve must open and allow the gas to exit. Because there is no opening here, like, like in the other, other thing, open system that you saw. Now, if we have a very strong vacuum and this bag collapses at times, not being able to hold even some residual volume, then it will create a negative pressure and that will get transmitted to the patient breathing system as well. To prevent that, we have here, we have got two negative pressure relief valves. Here is the waste pressure inlet. So this is about it. So what it happens in a closed system, the waste gas flow, the vacuum flow, and the size of the system's reservoir determines its effectiveness. Now, all closed interfaces must have a positive pressure relief valve to vent excess systemic pressure. Let us assume that we do not have a central vacuum here, and this we have is connected to a thick pipe which opens to the outside atmosphere. Now, if there is this, in that case, we are not going to generate any negative pressure in the system, but it is still possible to generate a positive pressure. In two reasons. Most importantly, if the exit pipes get blocked due to something, a kink or anything, any of that sort, then there would be pressure buildup inside this uh, reservoir bag and that would be transmitted to the patient. So we must have a positive pressure relief system in a closed system. But if we have an active vacuum, we also have to have a negative pressure relief system. Now, we're very close to the end. The passive scavenging system, the system is quite simple. If we do not have a reservoir bag here, the system is very simple. What you have, you have got a waste pipe inlet and this just goes out to a passive disposal assembly, which is nothing but a thick, stiff tube resistant to kinking, which opens outside. So what can happen here is that the problem, only problem that can occur here is that there can be a huge amount of gas with this pipe will not be able to cope under even normal circumstances or something happens, the pipe is kinked or bent or something, increasing resistance. So we have to have a relief valve we have a relief valve here, which will open if the system is pressurized to more than five centimeter of water. So the patient circuit is not pressurized. Now uh, we have this, uh, 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 we need a single positive pressure relief valve. And this transfer of waste gases happens due to the slight positive pressure of the gases leaving the patient's breathing system. This is just like an extension of the breathing system. So the patient's positive pressure that comes out at the expiration will expel the air. Now the waste gases are then passively vented either to an AC, which must be non-recirculating, otherwise it's going to put that air with the waste gases again into the operating room or outdoors. If it's open outdoors, we must make sure that it's not going to come back again. <clears throat> and it's covered with netting with the prevents insects and other things to get inside and build a nest. Disposal assembly conduit, it is the pipe beyond the interface. The interface was the thing that you were talking till now. So this conducts the gas from the scavenging interface to the receiving end of the gas disposal system. And it should be collapse proof and it should be overhead to minimize chances of accidental occlusion. It runs on the floor most of the time. Somebody steps on it and the tube gets narrower. Somebody steps on it and again, it becomes narrower and some part of time it becomes very narrow and will cause an increased pressure. So it should run overhead and should be a collapse proof tube. Collapse proof tubes are more expensive. So sometimes the tubes you know, people cheap out on the buying it and you can have a tube which can collapse and increase resistance. Hazards. So lastly, uh, let's talk about the hazards of an scavenging system. Now, it adds a complexity to the NSM. Now, we have spent, you know, several hours talking about the anesthesia system the last day and today. And still we have covered only a, you know, scratch at the surface. So this is a very complex system. Plenty of things can go wrong and we are adding some more things and we are adding more possibilities of things going wrong. But we hope that it doesn't go wrong and we get the benefit. So if we have an excessive vacuum applied to the scavenging system, it can have undesirable negative pressures. And if there's an obstruction in the scavenging pathway, it can cause excessive positive pressure in the breathing circuit. If it's an inadequate vacuum, especially at an open interface, then it can cause venting of the waste gases into the operating room. So I guess let's call it a day for today or evening. OK. Thank you, Palas, for this nice and big lecture.
Uh, we started with the yeah, except few pop breaks as well. Instead of the coffee breaks, it became cup breaks. <laughs> we're down to seventy-one, and uh, surprisingly, there are no questions at all. One one comment that comes from Bajaj Gupta: the fantastic call has no question of any questions. And Dr. Chumki Dotto has given a statement. The Maple Sun A is not a lap coaxial system. Now I want uh, Purba to comment on that. Sorry, sir. Please uh, repeat the question. Uh, Maple Sun A is not lap coaxial system. The comment which has come from Dr. Chumki Dutta. No, no, madam. It's not a uh, Maple Sun A, uh, A coaxial system uh, because in the Maple Sun A coaxial system, the phase gas is flow uh, comes from the machine end, and it is not uh, comes uh, from the patient end. And in uh, Maple Sun F uh, and ECE circuit, the phase gas flow comes uh, near the patient end. So. Um, the lag system is not that. Lag system is a modification of. Uh, uh, yes, it is a modification. Modification of the, of the, of the, of the A. It is only the modification of Apple's A. Um, and there, I I can't find any other question. Actually, oh, bean uh, circuit is a modification of Maples and D, where the fresh gas flow is um, opens to the towards the patient end. I think there is a little confusion regarding this Maples and A modification because Doctor again said that Maples and A is not a coaxial circuit. So, lack is a coaxial. Lack is lack is a coaxial circuit. Lack is a coaxial, the tube within the tube. Tube within the tube. Actually, maple sun A is not coaxial. I think no. Lack is the to, coaxial. Man, try to say say that. Yes. So, I think since there are uh, no other questions, uh, with the permission of Professor Jayanto Bhattacharjo, sir, can we close it for the day and say goodbye to everybody yes. and good night. Good night. Just to just uh, yes, yes, please, 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 please. I'm extremely sorry. I could not uh, use that uh, card, sir, because uh, that option was not with me. So um, it will be more helpful for students uh, to understand with the card, sir. It's all right. It's all right. I think uh, the second time when they go over your slides in the uh, website, in the website of HCP forum, uh, I think they will understand a little more and especially more before their exams. I believe. Yes, definitely. Anyway, and, so and let's say good night to of, everybody. All of us can be reach easily on WhatsApp. Any questions, even they crop up later. And honestly, we would like your opinion, your criticisms, so that in future we can change, modify, and improve. So let's call it a day. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, so sir. Let's good call night. it a night. Today. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, so sir. Let's good call night. it a night, actually. Good night, everyone. Good night, everybody.